Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Tuesday, March the 9th, 2021. On this edition of The Politocrat, voting, voting, voting. A look at what is happening across the United States in response to what you did last year and early this year at the voting booth. Plus, some additional reaction from the English press and from English politicians to the interview that Oprah Winfrey did of Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. All of that coming up next. Welcome back. How are you feeling today on this Tuesday, this second week of March? I hope you're well. I hope you're feeling as well as you can under all of the circumstances and things you're going through as we go through this final month of the first quarter of 2021. My goodness me, this year is already traveling by really fast. I hate to break that kind of news to you, dear listener. But I think you are acutely aware of that. (laughs) I think you are. And that is what we are heading into here as we fly through 2021. At least the first quarter of it is almost over. My goodness me. Spring will be here before the first quarter of the year is over in the next few weeks. Spring is coming in roughly, what, two and a half weeks In the UK, they put their clocks forward, I believe, at the end of this weekend on Sunday morning. Clocks going one hour forward, spring forward, fall back. And I will get confirmation of that. And for those of you listening in the United Kingdom, I will remind you later on this week that you have to put your clocks forward because I believe that is exactly what you will have to do this Sunday. So we are already heading to evenings that will be a little bit brighter. And that's what's going to happen. You're going to have um, slightly longer days, I think, if I do this in my mind correctly, if I do my (laughs) weather forecast uh, math correctly, daylight math, I believe my maths tell me that the days are going to be a bit brighter. You're not going to have darkness at four o'clock in the afternoon. Certainly not in the UK at the end of this weekend, unless you're talking about Boris Johnson and the conservative government. Oh, dearie me, what a mess, what a mess. And speaking of messes, the royal family, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about them a bit later on, mainly play you clips of some of the further reaction. And it was as I predicted. I'll get into that a little bit later on. It was absolutely as I said to you, it would be. Um, So that's coming up a little bit later on. Um, And also you're going to get to hear from someone that I was telling you about an episode or two ago. A politician in England, a long-serving politician in England, who um, is one of the great stalwarts She gets a lot of stick. I told you about her and I will um, keep you in suspense and in abeyance um, as to her identity. I think you know who it is that I am speaking of, but you'll be hearing from her. Um, She appeared yesterday on television in England, in the United Kingdom, and I'll be playing you just a bit of what she had to say. So that's coming up a little bit later on. But first... Um, A couple of things that I think you should be aware of, uh, as I'm going to focus mostly on the politics here in the United States. You may have missed this information, um, but I do want to pay attention to it here for the sake of those who may have missed this information. 
The House last week, the House of Representatives, and I have mentioned this before, voted robustly for stronger voting protection. That bill is it was called HB1. It was giving much more empowerment to voters, and the House passed that pretty convincingly last week. Um, because of all the COVID relief, um, back and forth, that news was announced, but it kind of went under the radar a little bit. So I do want to remind people of that. And I think I mentioned it yesterday as well, or the day before, but I just think it's important to mention that the House Democrats passed this bill. Now, again, as I may have alluded to before, dear listener, the House Democrats and the Democratic Party in general are very poor messengers or messages. They do not know how to craft a message, or maybe they do know, but they deal with it as if it's a hot potato. They just can't hold on to any any kind of good news that happens that they create on behalf of you, the American public, or you, whomever is listening. They, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They can't hold on. It's a hot potato for them. They don't know what to do with good news. And I contend that the Democratic Party has got to be better at its messaging. Because if it is not, oh my goodness me, the messaging is the biggest pro- one of the biggest problems the Democratic Party has. It doesn't know how to tout its great accomplishments. It's as if they are a shy 10-year-old boy who has just been kissed by the girl that he really likes. And he doesn't, but he just doesn't know how to kiss her back. You know what I mean? I, I, I remember that, by the way, when I was shy and 10 years old. on a playground in England and there's a girl that I really liked and she came up to me and she kissed me but I was so shy and embarrassed I didn't know how to respond to it and I just smiled and I just kind of clasped my hands together and kind of writhed into myself like a caterpillar or you know I don't know if that's but caterpillar I don't know but I I you know how Stevie Wonder, when he sings and he moves from side to side and it's, you know, he's feeling the music and he's, that's kind of how I was. I kind of just didn't know how to respond. And the Democratic Party is the same. They just don't know how to respond to good news. They don't know how to promote good news, which is really weird because why wouldn't you know how to promote that? The Republican Party knows how to lie and pound the lie into the ground so that you actually end up going, really? Did that really happen? Well, I don't go that way, but maybe somebody out there in the world kind of goes, hmm, did that really happen? No, but it's really the province of the Republican Party to do these kinds of things, to shout the loudest, to be the most furious, to be the the loudest, the just the most wretched And it kind of goes the way that the great poet W.B. Yeats once said. As as W.B. Yeats put it, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I'll repeat that. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. W.B. Yeats said that, and W.B. Yeats was correct. And the Republican Party are the ones with the passionate intensity. Now, it's toxic passionate intensity, and I've said before that James Baldwin has said you don't need numbers, you need passion. Yeah, but that's different from what W.B. Yeats is saying, which is it's always the people who shout the loudest, who are, well, not always, almost always, who are the ones who are lying to you, who are toxic, who are telling you lies. That's not always the case, but it's almost always the case, or many times it's the case. And the Democratic Party has got to learn how to be bolder, how to shout, how to be more passionate. But I think the reason why the Democratic Party over the last 30 years hasn't been is because it's been weighed down by the corporates and the moderates and the progressives know how to 
shout and be passionate. I mean, Cori Bush, my goodness me, she knows how to do it. And she does a darn good job, as do a few others. Bernie Sanders knows how to get passionate about something he believes in. Um, AOC, Congresswoman Alessandria Ocasio-Cortez, she knows how to do that. And there are a few others, as I say. But the party as a whole has got to do better, has got to. And that means, as I said the other day, DNC chair Jamie Harrison, you have to pull your finger out and you have to get together with your team and start strategizing around the messaging because 2022 is going to be here before you know it. It's only nine months away now. I said at the top of this episode that we are already almost at the end of the first quarter of 2021. And I'm telling you, this is, we have to start moving here. We have to get moving and we have to get active and we have to be involved because Another Republican senator has announced that he will not run for re-election in 2022. Roy Blunt, the Republican, he is he's leaving at the end of this calendar year. When we get to the beginning, well, he'll be in for the first few days of 2022. Excuse me, that's not correct. He will be in for the first few days of 2023. But he's gone after that. So this is an opportunity now. Here's a solution, folks, because I do offer solutions or attempt to. I do not just talk about what's wrong. I do offer. And I think you'll find that. Not that I need to defend myself. But I think you'll find that I do offer some things. And maybe they may not all work, but they certainly um, are things that we can do that are not beyond reach for any of us. As I say... And as I've said repeatedly here over the last few months, we have to have an agenda and we need to push that not only at Vice President Harris and President Biden, but also on local state levels. And I'll tell you why that will become even more true in a little short while, I promise. But what we are seeing is something very clear. Roy Blunt is the fifth Republican to say that he is not going to seek re-election to the Senate in 2022. That should be setting off alarm bells, not just with Jamie Harrison, and I'm sure that it is not going unnoticed by the chair of the Democratic Party, Democratic, the DNC. But I also think, but I'm sure that it should be setting off alarm bells or opportunity bells, rather, for you and me. We have to start joining organizations that are going to start pushing progressive Democrats. And why do I say that? Two reasons. One, moderate Democrats are losing their seats in the House. Last November 2020, moderate Democrats lost a lot of their seats in the House. They didn't run especially good campaigns. They spent their time as some moderates in the Democratic Party love to do and want, they are want to do this. Talking about how they are not really left, but they are more centrist and they're more kind of like the average Republican. And they spend their time trying to appeal to the Republican voter, who is a minority in this country, by the way since people love talking about minorities. They are a breed of voter that is registered far as less, considerably less than is a Democratic voter. And yet the Democratic Party, which has the wind at its back, chooses, for reasons known only to it, to still run and chase after Republican voters, the very voters that really do not care about the Democratic Party, don't want to be anywhere near Democrats, hate Democrats, or at least disrespect and despise them. How's that? And yet, the corporate Democratic strategy over the last few years has been to chase after Republican voters. Instead of consolidate their base, they chase after Republican voters. 
And they lose election after election for doing that. And instead of consolidating their base and pushing their base and priming their base and messaging to their base, what they're doing, these moderates in particular, is, oh, I'm going to just be middle of the roadie and I'm going to be, I'll appeal to the Republicans a bit more. And the Democratic Party, as I've said before, take black voters for granted. They have done it for too long, for too long, especially black voters for granted. And what the Democratic Party must do, Jamie Harrison, is consolidate its base and grow its base amongst the young, amongst the progressive, continue to push black voters. And you're not going to have too much trouble with that because black women organizers are doing a lot of that work and some black male organizers, black men organizing as well. Um, And Latino organizers are doing that um, as well. So black and brown voters are going to still come out and that is continuing to grow, which is why I'm going to get to the voting part coming up again in a few moments. I promise I will get there. But that's what we have to do. We need to join organizations and we need to start running progressive Democrats. We need to join organizations that will develop progressive Democrats to run in the Senate races, to run locally, to run on the state level. We can do it ourselves. If you're someone out there who's always wanted to run for office, whether it's dog catcher or school board or, you know, board supervisor or assembly person, Please do it. Please do it. Try to get some signatures. Try to get some sponsors. Try to get, well, people who are going to sign petitions for you, rather, I should say. And pick people's brains. If you're passionate about politics, if you're passionate about an issue, which is why I keep saying to you, write down the two or three things that mean the most to you and start pushing that with local, state, and national politicians, including, of course, Vice President Harris and President Biden. And you need to do that. And if you find that people are not being receptive, why don't you run? Run for office. Run for dog catcher. Run for school board. And put those principles of the things you want into the position you're running for. People will say, oh, it's too expensive, it's too... But when you start small, when you start as dog catcher, as school board person, believe me, that's how you start and that's how you gain a foothold. You don't have to start where Cory Bush did. And by the way, Cory Bush did not just um, come out of nowhere. She had a life that was really tough and she was an activist. She still is. And she's someone who is an activist who's now on the inside, and she's continuing that activist tradition on the inside. Now, granted, she's governed by protocol and a certain amount of um, pomp and circumstance in terms of what the house rules are and things, and she's not rude or disruptive. I don't, I'm not suggesting that at all. But what I'm saying is, is that she was sleeping in a car with her kids not too long ago. I mean, literally any, I mean, three years ago, maybe, maybe less, maybe more. And now she is a member of the House of Representatives, knocking off the longtime incumbent, William Lacey Clay, the second or the third. It's a dynasty of these Clays. And for the first time in 51 years in the first district of Missouri, there is someone not named Clay in that seat in the House. How about that? So it can be done. So my solution is that when you, when you hear that Senator Roy Blunt, the Republican, is not running for re-election in 2022, Rob Portman is not running for re-election in 2022, and I can go down the list. When you hear that, whether it's in the Senate, the House, or wherever in the country, It shouldn't just be a reaction tweet going, yay, he's not running, yay, she's not running, yay, they're not running. The reaction should be, right, let's now organize and get progressive Democrats in particular to run in these districts. 
that in these states, in these districts, in these cities, that should be the reaction on Twitter. And not just the reaction, that should be something that we should get involved in. And I'm not saying that we all have the time to do that. I actually don't have the time to do all of that. But there are things I do do, just like I'm sure there are things that you do. But we all can do something in our own small way. Some people march. Some people sign petitions. Some people donate money. Some people actually do join an organization. Other people get involved in Zoom meetings. We can all do a little something. And it doesn't have to be the big, big grand stroke. It can just be something small that we can do and that we're able and capable of doing to make this happen. I'm telling you. So that's the solution. When you hear this, and even if you don't hear of a Republican who isn't going to run anymore, we've got to be proactive as well. And we've got to start looking at 2022 because you see what the strategy is from the Republicans. They want to block Joe Biden. They want to slow down the legislation that he's trying to get through or the nominees that he's trying to get through. And I know Vanita Gupta and Lisa, I believe Lisa Monaco. I always get her last name wrong. It might be Monaco. Both of them are um, nominees inside the attorney justice, excuse me, the justice department. They are one of them. Vinita Gupta is the was is going to be the attorney um, for civil rights in the civil rights division in the Justice Department. And Lisa Monaco, I forgot what her title is going to be, but they are on Capitol Hill. They were on Capitol Hill today, and they had their confirmation hearing. The two of them. Now Merrick Garland, as I said yesterday, who of course should already be on the U.S. Supreme Court is due to have his vote in front of the larger Senate, the 100 senators, sometime this week. Uh, And I believe that's still on course to happen this week. I could be wrong, but from what I know, what I've learned, um, that's going to happen this week. And he'll be confirmed shortly. He was confirmed, I believe, last week or the week before by the Senate Judiciary Committee. It was a pretty comfortable, I believe it was uh, 15 to 7, in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And there were several Republicans that joined the Democrats on that committee to vote for him. And so it wasn't completely down party lines. But I just want to tell you that there are things that we can do. So that's the whole point of when I say that there are always opportunities for us to not only be reactive, but to be proactive, to join organizations. Think of the issues. They're great organizations. Mums Demand Action. Every Town for Gun Safety. Those are the first two I think of. Fair Fight, Stacey Abrams' organization. Our Revolution, the progressive organization uh, spearheaded by Bernie Sanders and was once, I think, chaired by uh, Nina Turner. Nina Turner, by the way, is running for Congress in 2022. Uh, uh, you know, she's running for Congress, for the House in Ohio. Hello, somebody. We need to support Nina Turner. And she is one of the really great political voices. And it is Women's History Month, Women's History Year. Yesterday it was International Women's Century. And um, I didn't mention it yesterday, but International Women's Century. um, You know, I want to wish every woman listening to the sound of my voice right now a very happy International Women's Century. I want to wish you that. And keep shining your light to every woman listening to me right now. Continue to shine your light and shine it bright. It's all in you. You have all the tools. And my message is to you, to shine your light. Welcome back. So before getting to voting, I do want to say that President Biden over the weekend, because uh, remember we've had the 56-year mark 
of Bloody Sunday. I talked about it yesterday briefly, um, or the day before, whichever. I mean, these days just really do bleed into each other. And he signed legislation to strengthen voting on a federal level, to strengthen voting protections. That was an executive order that he signed over the weekend. You may have missed that, so I want to make sure that you didn't miss it by mentioning it here. You um, should be aware of that. An executive order, I think it's the, I don't know now, I'm losing count. There have been at least 50 executive orders, if not more, that Joe Biden has signed and enforced here um, in the first almost, what, just over a month and a half, the first six weeks of his time in office, uh, if not a little bit more than six weeks. But the point is, is that um, I think Joe Biden so far is doing well. I've had my criticisms and you know very well what those are here. Um, But I do think still that the administration is still doing, um, I think, some largely positive things, despite my fierce objections to um, a few things that a few things that that have been going on that I am just not happy with. And I hope that you're not either. I hope that you aren't happy with bombs being dropped on Syria. And and I I hope you're not happy with that. You know, I hope you're not happy with this eagerness to compromise things that you agree that you want, that you wanted the $15 minimum wage provision. And he wanted that. So I, you know, he was fully supportive of that, but he compromised. And Vice President Harris, too, did not use the power that she has to overrule the Senate parliamentarian. So, yeah, I'm not happy about those things. Um, and hopefully you're not. Maybe maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it does to you. I don't know. I know that in the grand scheme of things, perhaps maybe some of you think or are of the mind that there's more important things out there. Uh, and maybe this doesn't concern you. And, and the $15 an hour minimum wage doesn't quite frankly concern me. It doesn't apply to me, I should say. But what I'm saying is that these are matters that we should care about because I'm sure there's someone we know who is affected by this, right? And even if we don't know someone who is, people in the country are. And we've got to start caring. I've talked about this, and I haven't talked about it every day, but I have talked about this during this podcast throughout the months, is we've got to have that compassion. We've got to have that empathy. We've got to have that kind of care for the greater concern of people in the country and beyond around the world. Two and a half million people have been taken by this virus and over 520,000 of them used to live here in the United States. They're no longer with us. We've got to start caring and have a little empathy and a little bit of sensitivity. My goodness me. You know, and I'm not talking necessarily, well, Ralph Tresvant, you need a man with sensitivity. I'm not necessarily talking that in that way, but I am kind of talking in that way. I mean, we've got to just get to be a bit more compassionate about what's going on and, and care about what's going on around us. It's like what James Baldwin said. If you don't know what's gone on before you, you do not know what's going on around you. And that is really true. So, President Biden signed an executive order over the weekend um, to strengthen federal voting rights and all kinds, you know, voting rights rather and capacity and capability to vote, protections. And what we've got now in response to that is an onslaught against voting in several states. I'm telling you, these Republicans do not go to sleep. You know, they don't go to sleep. These people are always plotting. They are not resting on their laurels. They're not being complacent. And remember, I keep saying to you, dear listener, that you cannot sit and not say anything when Joe Biden does things that you don't like or that you know are wrong, but you won't speak up about. Because again, this happened during Obama for eight years When he drone struck and when he deported people, there were only certain groups, activist groups, who were saying things, who were on the front line. 
I didn't hear all his celebrity friends say a darn word about what was going on with deportations. But when the you-know-what that left office a couple of months ago, violently, when that guy was ripping kids from their parents, everybody who's a celebrity or not, who supported Obama and who is a Democrat, but they were all jumping up and down and cursing out Trump, and rightly so. But how come when Obama's deporting record numbers of of people from this country, more than any other president in the history of the country, how come no one's saying anything about that on the Democratic side? How, How come only the groups that we know of, right, are saying things? How come only the groups that we know of are saying things? All the Latino groups and Latina groups and activists, how come only they're the ones? Why aren't we joining them? Why aren't you joining them? Why aren't you raising a noise about this? Why aren't you calling your local congressperson or your congressperson in the House? Why aren't you calling the White House? Comment line. I mean, that's what the activism is too. It doesn't have to be you marching. I mean, some of us can't march. Some of us can't move. Some of us can't walk. But if we have use of other abilities, use of other faculties, then we should do something, right? And it doesn't require that we have to march. And we it doesn't, you know... There's things we can do. Don't let what you cannot do stop what you can do. So that's the thing that's going on. We've got to really look at this because these Republicans are not sleeping. They've now, in at least a few states, have now started to put up legislation that will make it harder for you and I to vote in the United States. There's always a backlash, isn't there? Always. Or a white lash. It's that large numbers of black people and brown people last November and before that, of course, with the early voting that went on and in early January of this year in Georgia, large numbers of black, brown, native, and I should add Asians, also voted Democratic. And you know what happens there. Ooh, oh my gosh. Arizona, Democratic, two Democratic senators. Georgia, Democratic, two Democratic senators. Oh my goodness me. We've got to do something about that, the Republicans are saying. And so what do they do? Here's what they do. They introduce a law in Georgia. Let's start there, shall we? And as Stacey Abrams so ably put it, Georgia, her state, the home of Fair Fight Action, her great organization, and all that Stacey Abrams did last year and this year, and what Latasha Brown did and uh, Cliff Albright and others, I believe that's his name, what these folks did to organize people and many other organizers, of course, Chuck Rocha, who I spoke to on this program, on this podcast last year about his organization, Nuestro PAC and how Latinos are organizing and this Voto Latino with Maria Teresa Kumar and so many other people doing activist work and getting the Latino vote out and keeping it out there and developing a consciousness amongst Latinos so that they are continuing to vote. And there's many different Latino communities, just like there are many different black communities. I mean, we really should be pluralizing, if that's a word. We should be making plural. I think it is a word. We should be pluralizing 
these communities because there's more than one. There's more than one black community. There's more than one gay community. There's more than one brown community and Latino community. There's many different Latino communities. There's many different black communities. And there's many different gay communities, by the way, as I said. So, and, 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 and that applies to almost every community. There's, there's not just one monolith. There's no monolith. And so, this is what Stacey Abrams tweeted out yesterday. And she included this. And I, I'm going to start with reading this thread. This week, this is Stacey Abrams at Stacey A-B-R-A-M-S Abrams. S-T-A-C-E-Y Abrams. I'll link to her Twitter um, handle so that you can, on the line notes, so that you can um, see this tweet, by the way. I'll link to that. And then that's the way you can you can read this as well. And I'm going to read it out so you can hear this. This week, this is yesterday from March 8th on her Twitter page. This week, there is a coordinated attack on voting rights. GOP-led legislatures in Georgia, Arizona, and New Hampshire are pushing dozens of bills to make it harder for people of color and young people to vote. We voted in November, and instead of listening, they are trying to shut us out of the process. And this is that's the first of 18 tweets in a thread. So I'm not going to read all 18 of them, but I'll read some of them. This is what they're doing in Georgia. Again, I'm reading from this, from Stacey Abrams. Senate Bill 241, SB 241, the Georgia Senate bill. Would end no excuse voting by mail, risk identity theft of voters, and allow the legislature in Georgia to steal power from state and local election officials. I'm going to read that again. SB 41 in SB 241 in Georgia would end. This is Stacey Abrams telling you this on Twitter, tweeting you this would end. No excuse voting by mail. Risk identity theft of voters and allow the legislature to steal power from state and local election officials. It's one of the worst vote-by-mail bills in the nation and part of the largest push to restrict voting rights since Jim Crow. These people, I keep telling you, these Republicans, they are moving hell to get us out of the voting process. They looked at what happened in September, October, and November of 2020. They looked at what happened in December and January. December of 2020 and January of this year, 2021. And they said, hold on. Ah, 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 ah. We have to counter this. And that's exactly what's happening. You are seeing it right now. And let me tell you something. That Senate bill in Georgia and the Georgia State Legislature, Senate Bill 241, it passed in the the, uh, Senate. Yesterday, while people were focusing on other things like the start of the trial of Derek Chauvin who murdered George Floyd and I have to watch people going a Chiron on the bottom of your TV screen I have to watch Chiron that says the trial of George Floyd as if George Floyd is on trial George Floyd is was murdered he's dead and I have to read Chiron that says the death of George Floyd trial what I mean how much Can you get language that's any more passive than that? It's just ridiculous. It's the trial of Derek Chauvin. That's the motherfucker that sat on the neck of George Floyd with his knee for nine blooming minutes. Looking at the camera saying, hello, mom. Hi, mom. Don't tell me it's the the death of George Floyd trial. What is that, Court TV? Anyway, I digress. 
So while we were, some of us were focused on the jury selection for that trial, which is, um, you know, jurors are being sworn in today. They were sworn in today at that trial in Minnesota. And what do you think the outcome of that trial is going to be? Georgia Republicans were passing in their Senate a extremely dangerous anti-democratic voting bill. I mean, this, this is really dangerous stuff. And that's the stuff that you've got to pay attention to, dear listener, because this is happening in Georgia. It was passed there yesterday. Again, I must tell you, that the uh, rate of passage was 29 to 20 in the Senate. In Georgia. You know, this is what's so insidious about these Republicans. They spent the better part of a year telling you, and you know who I'm talking about here, I don't want to mention his name anymore, telling you that the election was going to be rigged, it's going to be rigged, it's stolen, it's going to be the biggest election rigging ever. They spent a year telling you this. Not just him, but all of them who stood by him and didn't challenge that until he was almost out of office, until two weeks after he led a terrorist attack against the United States Capitol, against the country, against us, against us, us. That needs to be emphasized, by the way. It wasn't just on the Capitol building. It was an attack on all of us, all of us. But for a year, if not more, He was telling you, oh, it's going to be the biggest, most rigged election. And you know what? Not only was it not a rigged election, and it was the most error-free, fraud-free election in the history of elections, according to Republican officials like Chris Krebs, who was promptly fired. Remember that? Out of the cybersecurity division in the Homeland Security area. Remember that? And there was all and and all fifty of the secretaries of state said no. This would there was no fraud found, none. We looked all through up up hill and dale, over hill and dale to find it, and there was none. And even and and never mind the fact that there were about seventy frivolous lawsuits. And by the way, those all of those attorneys, and I know this right as someone who's an attorney, all of them should have been given rule. Um, 16, I believe it is, gosh, or Rule 8 sanctions, whatever the civil procedure sanction is. They should have all been given sanctions for wasting the the bar's time, wasting the court's time with frivolous lawsuits, almost 70, 70 of them. And they were all tossed out, but one which dealt with, oh, the voting observer must be able to stand a little bit closer to look and see if there's anything going on. I mean, all the stuff you heard last year, that testimony in Michigan before that election commission there, and I talked about that, I even had on this podcast, one of the people who testified before that committee, Laura Cron- Laura Cronin. I mean, come on. Come on, people. After all of that, all of those lawsuits, those court challenges that the judges all over the country laughed out of court All of them. After all of that, all of the Republican elections officials in Georgia, like Brad Raffensperger, no friend to us, by the way, like Gabriel, um, and I forget his last name now, who said he's got to knock it off. Stop saying this. People are going to die. And two months before he said, two months after he said that, what happened on Capitol Hill on January 6, 2021? People died. They were killed. And this is what Gabriel Sterling, that's his last name, Gabriel Sterling, the Republican official in Georgia, elections official, he told you this in November of 2020. (sighs) 
after all of the Republicans that said no, no fraud, and the officials I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the poll, I'm talking about the state elections officials. They all came out, no, 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 nothing here. The courts, Trump appointed judges telling you, no, no, nothing to see here. You, this is a stupid court challenge. Don't waste my time with this. And they'd throw the suit out. They'd throw the court challenge out. Giuliani with his hair dye streaming down his face. Isn't that disgusting? And making an ass of himself should have been disbarred. Oh, we're only going to remove him, remove him from the New York State Bar Association, but we're not going to take his license. This guy, if that was me, if that was any of you who practice law out there, you would have had your bar license stripped before sundown. You would have. You would have. We all, we know that. We know that. As attorneys, we know that. That that would have been the end of it. But Rudy Giuliani, trial by combat Rudy Giuliani, oh no. He gets to keep his law license, dear listener. He gets to keep it. All of these things, all of these fraudulent, lying Republicans who challenged the courts, and they knew they had no case. Giuliani even admitted in one court appearance that he didn't have any evidence of fraud. None. So why are you wasting the court's time? Well, you're doing it for your base that doesn't have much of an, a bit of intelligence. I mean, come on, folks. After all of that, what do the Republicans do? In, including kill at least seven people or encourage it? They now pass bills in Georgia limiting and curtailing early voting. They now pass bills in Georgia, at least in the Senate, curtailing early voting, curtailing all of these things. This is just so evil. So they're telling you that it's rigged, but they're the ones who are doing the bloody rigging. That's what it is. That's the double speak. Accuse you of the thing that they are actually doing. They've taken this to an art form now. And they've been doing this for a long time, but now it's even more slick and more insidious. It's this classic projection. I'm going to accuse you of what it is I am actually doing to you. Let's add that to it. Oh, the Democrats are rigging and it's the Republicans doing it with these bills that see no one get see no one pays attention to this news that I'm giving you. I mean some people do, but most people don't, right? I said it earlier. I quoted W the poet W. B. Yeats for a reason. And I don't do these things by accident, dear listeners, you know. Unscripted though this podcast may be, these things do come together. The threads of <laughs> the threads of consciousness do actually strand together and tie together. I'm gonna to repeat for the third time, I'm gonna say this. This is what the poet W. B. Yeats said. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. W.B. Yeats couldn't have been more correct on that. Those words are a sense of poetry, aren't they? They really are a kind of poetry. Because the worst of them, of the passionate, intense ones, these Republicans, are shouting now. What they mean, rather, they were shouting in November and the, a, year, a year ago, Screaming, oh, the election's rigged. It's going to be rigged. And now quietly, they are rigging it. Right now, right now, with these bills like SB 41, SB 241, which has passed in the Georgia Senate, it's now going to go to the Georgia House. By the way, there are some Republicans who oppose this, but 
I don't think it's going to be enough to stop it in the Georgia House. Here's something from Ari Berman. Here's why Georgia, this is his Twitter account. I'll link to this too. Here's why Georgia GOP repealing is repealing the no excuse absentee voting. The white share of male voters dropped from 67% in 2016 to 54% in 2020, while the black share of male voters grew from 23% in 2016 to 31% in 2020. This is according to the Brennan Center. 30% of black voters voted by mail versus 24% of white voters voting by mail. This is from the... I mean, this is what it is, folks. It's the racist Republicans. Because the white population is dwindling. And the black and brown populations of all of these states, of all of the country, is growing. And just because they don't want, like the royals, they don't want Archie's skin color. He might be a little bit dark, that one, you know. Now, oh, the voters, the electorate's getting a little bit darker, you know. It's getting a bit more black. It's getting a bit more brown, you know. And so these Georgia Republicans now are using their racist ways and trying to legislate and legislating their racism. It's Jim Crow all over again in 2021. It's Jim Crow. That's what this is, dear listener. It's Jim Crow. It's Jim Crow. One thing the Senate didn't do, according to Ari Berman, the Georgia Senate did not pass a bill repealing automatic voter registration. That's a very big thing that they didn't do. And that was the key to Georgia winning, to to the two Democratic senators winning. Five million out of the 7.6 million Georgians registered or updated registration through automatic voter registration. And one million new voters were added to the voting rolls in Georgia since 2016. Two thirds of them voters who are black and brown and Asian. This is an attack on, you see what I mean? I want you to understand this, dear listener. Remember when Rudy Giuliani was on, well, Fox. TV, Fox News. Remember when he was on there talking about, well, we need to look at these black and brown voters and black people in Detroit. And he didn't say black, but everybody knows the population of Detroit is overwhelmingly black. Black, African-American, overwhelmingly black. We, 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 the voters in Detroit, well, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating about the... These guys were, you remember this well, And you heard the Michigan testimony, if you listen to some of the excerpts of it that I played, where you had uh, vote protection monitors looking and seeing all these Republicans making challenges to every black person who was voting. Every black person, they challenged them. Oh, and it was all the states the Republicans were challenging that had black voters in them. The cities of those states, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia in Pennsylvania specifically. Oh, the city of brotherly love. And so they challenged those folks. The Republicans challenged the black folks there. The Republicans challenged the black folks in Detroit. Detroit. The, uh, come on. The Republicans challenged the black folk in Milwaukee, make up 70 to 80% of that city's population. The black folk in Georgia, in Atlanta, hot Atlanta. They challenge these Republicans. Challenge. Oh, come on. Don't tell me that that's not racist. And meanwhile, the people who are voting twice are these white Republicans voting twice. 
They don't care about democracy. They don't care. They do not care. They care about power. They care about winning at any cost, which is the criminal corrupt cost. That's what they care about. They don't care that they're stripping voting rights. Why do you think President Biden's signing these executive orders? This is about a power grab, stealing. This is criminality. It's criminal. But because we do not have a national voting law in this country, we have a federal one that is still being chipped away at and all but eviscerated now thanks to the Supreme Court. And now we're trying to get this bill passed in the Senate so that we can have something we don't have a national voting standard so you've got every state's got its own rules and that's why you've got Georgia the Republican led Georgia Senate doing these odious things in the House I mean if the House passes this you're going to see voter suppression it's a voter suppression Jim Crow bill that's what this is This SB241 is trouble. And I'm not talking Lindsey Buckingham trouble. I'm talking it's trouble. It really is. This is about getting black and brown people off the voting rolls and making it white so that you've got white people voting and most of them are going to vote for Republicans. As we know, the majority of white people vote for Republicans. And we've seen it in these general elections. We've seen it in a lot of elections. It's not true in every single election, but it's true in a vast majority of them. It's been true in the general election in the United States for president for, oh my gosh, over 30 years now. I think actually 1992 was the last time that the majority of white voters voted for a Democratic president, Bill Clinton. I think that was the last time. So we're almost 30 years on from that. And ever since then, white people have voted for the Republicans in the majority. They voted, you had white women and white men voting majority for for Trump. And And now they want to consolidate that by getting rid, they mean the Republicans, all over this country. They want to consolidate that by getting rid of black and brown voters, passing these kinds of voter suppression bills and that's where the source of crime gets made because they're not doing what Yates said now they were doing all that for a year now they're doing the quiet part ooh we're in the senate of Georgia and we're in the the house in Georgia in the legislature there and we're going to pass this stuff that's what's going on and the spotlight needs to be shined on it it needs to be shone on it I should say proper English The white vote share is declining. So these, you know what, are going are now saying, well, we need to decline the black share and the brown share. Because we know that, you know, most of the white population, they're having less children. Their rates of childbirth are going down. The rates of black and brown childbirth are marginally increasing or increasing. We know those are future voters. So we need to kill that noise now, pardon my language. And... We need to get them off the voting rolls. And that's what they're doing. That's what they're trying to do. They're doing this in Arizona. They're doing it in New Hampshire. Dozens of bills. You heard Stacey Abrams. GOP-led legislatures in Georgia, Arizona, and New Hampshire. All places where Joe Biden won. I think. Yeah, I believe. New Hampshire, I think he did win there. Um... He won in Georgia and Arizona. And they're pushing dozens of bills in these states these rep- to make it harder for people of color, black po- folk and brown folk and Asians and natives and young people. That's what they, they're attacking the future because they know damn well that young people, most of them are not going to vote for a regressive backward party called the Republican Party. Or now really the Nazi party because these guys now are campaigning with guns and campaigning on stages that are built after Nazi stages at CPAC. 
last week. I mean, they are, they are, and you know, the guy that left the White House after killing, after playing his hand into killing at least seven people and also genociding uh, 400,000 plus due to COVID. I want to see an investigation in Congress on that. You're not going to, by the way, spoiler alert. But remember when they introduced a logo for his re-election bid? And that logo was right out of the Third Reich. Everything but the swastika. sticker. These folks are not hiding anymore. They're not hiding. They are telling their Nazi loyalists, come out, come out, wherever you are. That's what they're telling them. And they're doing that now in these state legislatures. This is where we have to keep our eyes open, dear listener. We have to keep our eyes open. And you know how we deal with this? We push back. We call the Democratic politicians in these states. We call them in our local areas. And we ask them, is this kind of thing going on here? What's going on? Are they trying to strip our voting rights away in in your city, in our city? You need to call your Democratic politicians, state, local, and federal. You need to get involved in that. Make a phone call. Write a letter. Send an email. Send a tweet. Donate money. Join an organization. That's how we deal with all of this. Keep alerting people to this. Get involved. Write to these Republicans as well. Get involved. I don't care how you do it. Get involved. Get up, get into it, and get involved. I know James Brown said that one time. Get involved, people. We need to. We've got to. Because otherwise, you're going to have the swastika brigade back in power. And they'll start adorning the blooming House and Senate with, with, with that kind of disgusting insignia. They'll start doing it in the state legislatures. You think I'm joking. You think I'm off my rocker here. I am dead serious. If you can go to CPAC, the Conservative a Political Action Committee conference, or whatever the hell that was last week, or the week before, and ha- and be on a stage for four days that's designed that's a replica of the Nazi stages, then who's to say that they're not going to do that? I'm telling you, we can slip into darkness so damn quick in this country. And I said this a few days ago. You've got President Biden and Vice President Harris and the Democrats in power, but it's very tenuous, folks. They are on a small little island, as I said last week. And you've got all these alligators and crocodiles called Republicans nipping at their heels. And all the while, the island that they are standing on, the vice president and president, and the Democrats, it is getting smaller under their feet. They're in power, but they're hanging on to it. It's not a, we're in power and we are consolidating. And No, it's very, very fragile. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. That's the truth. And part of the problem here too, as well as these ravenous, violent Republicans, criminal Republicans, is that Democrats are compromising things. That will turn voters off lickety split. I mean, that will like that, turn voters off. So you've got Republican state legislators right now in various states, state legislatures, Republican-led ones, doing all these things around the country as a reaction to the November smackdown they got in the White House and the January repudiation they got in Georgia in the Senate and Arizona they lost in November And they're reacting to all of that with these vicious Jim Crow laws. These bills that if they get passed in both chambers of these state legislatures, forget it. You are going to have a depressed turnout. You're going to have so many black people who are not going to be able to vote because of these vicious laws. Anti-democratic laws. Voter suppression laws. 
And part of the problem, as I said as well, is that you've got Democrats compromising out minimum wage on that COVID-19 bill, which still has not been passed yet in the House. It should be this week, the amended version of the Senate bill. Joe Manchin, you've got to, I said this before, you've got to primary that guy now with a progressive Democrat. I know he voted for the bill and I'm glad he voted for the final bill as amended, but I'm sorry, you're taking money out of people's pockets. West Virginia, a place where you had a Repub- you still have a Republican g- governor, even the Republican governor, Jim Justice, disagreed with and differed with the Democratic Senator, Joe Manchin of the same state of West Virginia about some of the things that were going on in that bill. He approved that bill. Jim Ju- this is the same Republican Governor Jim Justice who was throwing down the gauntlet at teachers in West Virginia just two and a half years ago in 2018. Nope, nope, you can't have a pay rise. We're not going to give you a, page, a pay, pay rise, teachers. No, no, no. And what did the teachers do in conservative West Virginia? They strike. They went on strike. They struck. They went on strike for days and days and days and days and days. We want pay rise. We want pay rise. We want to pay. Better schools. We want more school lunches. We want healthier food for the students. We want school supplies. We don't want to keep buying school supplies for the teat, for the school, for the students. We're buying pens and papers in the richest country in the, in the world for students. That's what we're doing in West Virginia. And we're not even getting a pay rise. Hell no. We're going to go on strike. The entire state, I believe it's 38 counties or 53 counties or whatever it is, each one of their Those county's teachers went on strike. They brought that system to its knees. And you know what else? Within a few days of days and days of striking, nine days, ten days, whatever, many days, the Republican governor in the so-called conservative state of West Virginia, the Republican governor caved in and he said, okay, I cry uncle. You'll get what you want. I'll give you your pay rise. So don't tell me that we can't run a progressive Democrat against Joe Manchin when he is up for re-election, whenever that is. Don't tell me it can't be done. Oh, it's a conservative state. West Virginia's conservative. You put that defeatist thinking out there. So you give yourself an excuse not to get active. And these Democrats who are crapping away and pissing away the fragile majority that they've got. You shouldn't tell people that they shouldn't say defund the police. Because whatever those moderate Democrats were running last November, it wasn't working. It ain't working because their asses got beat. They got voted out of office by the actual Republicans. And as I've said before, and as President Truman said, he, the bomb dropper on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atomic bomb dropper, as he once said, if voters have to choose between picking a Republican who is a real Republican and a Democrat who tries to be a Republican, they will pick the real Republican every time. And it's true. And you saw that again last November in those House Democratic races. And I told you before on this podcast that there was a debate that I saw between Max Rose and I think her name is Nicole uh, Nikulidakis from New York. She is now in Congress. And that debate that I saw on C-SPAN, it was hosted by Errol Morris of New York One. Spectrum New York One News. Errol Morris, you know who he is. If you follow politics like I do, you know who Errol Morris is. In New York, you know who he is, right? In New York. He's also appearing, he appears nationally on some of these cable shows. I don't watch him, but I know because when I used to watch him, I'd see him. 
And that debate, Max Rose, who was representing Staten Island, the Democrat, he sucked, for lack of a better... He was awful. And Nicole... I forget her last name. Makulu Darkis. I don't remember. I know it's a Greek last name. And I just don't remember the exact name. But she was so composed. And she was... You know, I didn't agree with some of her ideas. But the point is, she was able to articulate what she stood for. What she stood for. And there is a cross-segment of the country who... If you put forth your opinion and your view and you have belief and conviction in your view, they will vote for you. Even if they disagree with some of your policies, they'll vote for you. I'm telling you it will happen. And Max Rose, the Democrat, was sitting there and hemming and hawing. and Oh, well, I, I reject to fund the police. And oh, and ah, uh, and ah, uh, I'm trying to be a Republican, you know. And the guy was horrible. And Nicole, again, forgive me, I don't remember her last name. She was sitting there. She had this bright red. Again, this is about optics. This is not sexist, what I'm about to say, but this is optics. He was wearing this dour, gray, black kind of dour ensemble. She wore this bright red. Pow, pow, pop. That color popped. And I'm telling you, color does things to people. And I'm not talking about in terms of black, white people, you know, black people, white people. Color. I mean, yeah, that does too, right? <laughs> but I but I mean, the, you know, racism, the, that's what the racists do. But I mean colors in terms of colors on your clothing. And she knew exactly what she was doing with that. Eye popping, eye catching. Is optics. The viewer's looking at the screen and she stands out. And I'm not talking about what she looks like, what her face looks like, anything like that, physical. I'm talking about, pow, she chose to wear red. Boom. And it's not just because she's a Republican, but she chose red. And it stood out on my teeth. I'm sitting there in HD, high definition, watching that, pow. So you're already focused on her. And I'm not, again, I'm not talking about any part of her physically. I'm talking about, boom, you're locked in subliminally because you're already noticing that color red. It's a powerful color on clothing, in history, of course, and in life. And there's so many studies that have been done about the color red and, and the optics and what it does to the brain and all these things. Even statistics about football teams. Football, I'm not talking NFL football, I'm talking about the real football. The, the teams that wear red tend to win their games 55% of the time versus losing them 45% of the time. No kidding, I don't know, but that's some studies that I've heard of. That the team that wears red in a cup final in football, say Manchester United or Liverpool or whomever, who traditionally wear red as their primary, first as their first colour, they tend to win more of those cup finals than the team who is not wearing red. I mean, and Nicole had it down, had it down. And she was much more effective. And these things do play on voters' minds. Now, I'm not saying she won because she wore red now. Come on. But I'm saying she made a better presentation because of what she was saying. And again, better messengers, better messages. They are better messages than the Democrats are. And they're toxic messages and messengers, messengers and messages. They are better messages than the Democrats are. And that's why, again, I keep saying, Jamie Harrison, you have got to come up with something here. And I just want to say again, um, we have to start running progressive Democrats against these Republicans in 2022. Because the progressives are the only ones that are gaining seats. Cory Bush, all these people came in in 2020. Progressives were upsetting all these moderate Democrats. See, damn, I'm telling you. Marie Newman knocked off a conservative Democrat. 
she of Illinois. She's in Congress now. She's a progressive Democrat, right? Jamal Bowman knocked off a, a moderate Democrat, Elliot Engel, who had been there for 30 plus years in New York, right? There was a judge, a now she's not running for Congress, but there's a judge in Wisconsin, liberal judge, a you know, Democratic judge, knocking off a Republican in the Wisconsin Supreme Court election. There, I mean, I can go, and then other, and then members of Congress, again, I want to get back to Congress, others who knocked off, like Cory Bush, knocking off a moderate Democrat. Hello? Do you see a theme here? Do you hear a theme? These progressive Democrats are the ones that are winning these elections. And the corporate Democratic Party can no longer ignore this. The corporate Democratic Party has got to stop going to war with the progressives in the party. Stop it. Lay down your bayonets. And get with the program. Because the program now is progressive. You've got young voters who the Republicans are trying to stop voting. You've got black and brown and native and Asian voters who the Republicans are trying to stop from voting. And then you've got you as Democrats, the centrists, the the blue dogs, the corporates who are trying to, who are maligning progressive Democrats. It's a two pronged assault from both of the parties. But yet, who's winning these elections on the Democratic side now? Mostly? It's the progressive Democrats. I know where it counts, so called where it counts. You had a moderate. Democrat winning the presidential election and you had a moderate senator getting in in Arizona. But the point is, is that progressive voters did all that, most of them. Progress, progressives voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden. And I'm telling you, all these House races where all these state legislatures are putting these voter suppression Jim Crow bills in. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It's these progressive Democrats that are winning and the people voting for them are doing this. So you've got to, Democratic Party, Jamie Harrison, you have got to listen to the progressive voter. You've got to listen to us. You've got to listen to these progressive candidates. We've got to keep running them because that really is our hope of consolidating this house which is only a slender lead like 10 or 11 it was something like 30 before november of last year and speaker pelosi just kind of oh you know well we held on to the house you held on to it you're holding on to it by your fingernails now you've got to be uh, you the vision here now is got to be consolidating the house and consolidating this senate there's a lot of work that we all have to do. I'm going to come back with a clip, really, from a politician from England. I'm going to skip all the other British press stuff because it's as I said it would be. Predictably, predictably, protecting the monarchy at all costs and blaming Oprah for doing the interview and blaming the two people who no longer are under royal control, who've relinquished their royal duties and questioning. I'm just giving you a shorthand version of what they, they would have said. I would have played all this, but the time is short. They, 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 they are sitting there on Sky, Sky Paper's press preview and they're talking. Oh, we, I question the efficacy in which they did this interview because they, someone should have, they should have consulted with someone. How, consult with who? They're no longer part of the royal family, mate. What are you talking about? You and you and your press folks, your right wing racist press extradited them. You guys pushed them out of the country. And now when they give an interview to Oprah, American royalty. You're now complaining. There's no pleasing you, as Chaz and Dave once said. Ain't no pleasing you.
Chaz and Dave, ain't no pleasing you. There ain't no pleasing them. I mean, my goodness me, you know? Oh, goodness gracious me. I, I, anyway, I don't know what my, some of my fellow country persons want. Especially in the English press. Again, and look, not, again, you've got the Daily Mirror, which is a, a paper that is much more uh, a labor paper, pro labor, um, left wing, if you will, paper that is much more uh, representing the voice of the people than a rag like the Daily Mail, tabloid garbage that that is, the sun, the the, 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 the Daily Express, the, the Blumen Telegraph, that horrible news, just odious, the stuff that they write in the Daily, in the Telegraph, oh God, it, it's just disgusting, just just put some toilet paper. I mean, it's like they're literally writing on toilet paper that's been used. I'm sorry to paint that disgusting picture, but that's what the, the Daily Mail and the Telegraph are. They're absolutely disgraceful. Disgraceful. And the sun. Oh, God. Anyway. I would like you to listen now to... The esteemed member of Parliament, Ms. Diane Abbott. She is a stalwart of Labour politics. She was the shadow Home Secretary. And she made news in, I believe it was 2020 or 2019, uh, becoming the first black person to head a PMQs which is what she did when she was up against, oh dear, I forget which, it might have been David Liddington on the conservative side. PMQs, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is Prime Minister's Questions. That's what PMQ stands for. And PMQs happens on a Wednesday, so it will be tomorrow, the next one, I believe. It doesn't happen every Wednesday all the time because there are some times where they don't have them. But generally speaking, it's every Wednesday, every single Wednesday. With the you know they have breaks and vacation holidays and whatnot, but PMQs Prime Minister's Questions is held every Wednesday. You can watch it in the United States on C-SPAN at around four a.m. on the West Coast, seven a.m. on the East Coast of the United States. You can watch it online as well if you don't get a chance to watch it at the time it's actually happening. Of course, in England that is twelve p.m. in the afternoon on Wednesdays. But it, it takes place every Wednesday in the House of Commons in Westminster in, in London and central London. And um, you have the prime minister taking questions from other members of parliament, including from his own party as well. And so Diana Abbott was representing the Labour side, which would have been represented at the time by Jeremy Corbyn. And I believe, yeah, Jeremy Corbyn, because this would have been 2019 uh, and certainly or it would have been 2020 before K- Sakir Starmer got in because Sakir Starmer got in in April of 2020. So he's almost been there a year now. And that's a whole nother thing. I need to talk about Sakir Starmer again because there's been a lot that's gone on and I've talked about it. I've had uh, Nigel Nelson on, um, who is the longest running political editor in all of Britain uh, for the Daily Mirror. Uh, the, the, excuse me for the Daily Sunday Mirror and the Sunday People, um, Daily Mirror and Sunday People, and uh, so you know, I mean, Diane Abbott either last year or the year before stood in, and she made history as the first Black person to head Prime Minister's Questions after all these hundreds of years. And you don't think that England has racism and racists replete in it and that the royal family as an institution, you don't think they don't have, you don't think they have racists in there? You don't think the English press, that right wing of the English press, you don't think they're a bunch of racists? And you look at the newsrooms and they are even whiter than the newsrooms are here in the United States. You look at even the people on LBC and my good buddy, you know, I don't know him personally, good buddy James O'Brien, 
who's a white guy who talks about race, who says, and then he's part of a new, of a of a program lineup that is all white and all male, except for one white female. And occasionally you'll get one black man, David Lammy, for goodness sakes, who is the justice secretary now, shadow justice sec, justice minister for labor. The MP, David Lammy, the esteemed late David Lammy, who has his little spot on LBC radio in, in England on a Saturday morning. And um, Najid Nawaz, I believe his name is, Majid Nawaz, uh, may, may be mispronouncing, who has his spot. There's one or two, but come on now. England, England, my native country's got so much work to do. We have a few black barristers here and there, but my God, in the media. Oh my goodness me, there's not very many. And yeah, they're in front of the camera, but I mean behind the camera. I mean I mean managing and the, making the decisions. Oh my God, it looks like 1800 out there. Even though, again, we know that there are lots of black people in black tutors and all kinds. And yet, in 2021... There's less black people now, it seems, in these positions. And it's just so far away from where we've got to be. I mean, the relationship between the actual population of the world or of England, of the UK or of America to the actual newsrooms. Oh, my God. It's just you couldn't have a greater disconnect. And that's about power. It's about white dominance. It is about control. It's about institutional racism and racists who are white, who are making these decisions to not hire black people. They're not giving up their power. These white people who are making these, they're not giving up their power. They're not giving it up. They're not doing a Casey and the Sunshine Band saying, give it up. They're not. They're not doing that. They have no intention of it. And there'll be some pretty sounding slogans and who in the Premier League and they're trying to do this and they're trying to do that about no room for racism and taking the knee, which is all good. But what is the policy behind all of it? Rather than the symbolic gestures, which I do like that they're doing that, but what's going on in policy to change things? Not a whole hell of a lot right now. Not a whole hell of a lot. Here is, I give you before, any further ado, the one, the only, the one that, by the way, the most abused member of the House of Commons. Yesterday, this was Diane Abbott talking about Meghan Markle. Joining me now is Labour's Diane Abbott, an equality campaigner who was, of course, the first black woman elected to Parliament. And... Uh, Thank you very much for being with us. Let's talk about International Women's Day uh, first. I mean, are you celebrating? I mean, let's talk about black women in politics, uh, for instance. Are you celebrating or is there much, much more to do? You know, there is stuff to celebrate. When I first became a member of parliament, there were just 41 women members of parliament altogether and only 21 Labour women MPs out of 650 MPs. Now, in we have 220 women MPs out of 650 and 104 Labour women MPs. So there is stuff to celebrate, but there is further to go. Yeah, and I mean, are um, black MPs being given the right jobs, uh, the, the, you know, the jobs of leadership? Well, you know, we've got um, David Lammy, who's the Justice Secretary. Um, We've got Marshall Cordova, who's Equalities. I think that both women and ethnic minority MPs are being offered a much broader range of jobs now than they would have been offered, say, 10, 20 years ago. And you, of course, were um, Shadow Home Secretary. But let's just talk about... uh... Uh, what's dominating the news and Meghan Markle and uh, the claims that she's made of racism uh, against the royal family. What do you make of that? Well, the idea that people were worrying 
about exactly how dark her son would be is really quite distasteful. And it's a great shame. It's a great shame because when she first got engaged to Harry and they had their wonderful wedding, we all thought it was it was a sort of new dawn for the royal family. It was really embracing multiracialism. But it seems that some members of the royal family weren't embracing multiracialism at all. Because if the one allegation, and we don't know whether it's uh, true, if the one allegation portrays the royal family as racist, that is incredibly serious and that is incredibly damaging because many people, many observers have said that Meghan Markle was welcomed into the royal family and Charles walked her down the aisle and that there's, there's no evidence of that racism. What would you say about that? Almost from the beginning, um, you had that fabulous wedding, but from the beginning, the abuse and the unpleasantness in the tabloid media was almost relentless. I mean, daily, there were articles and commentators attacking Meghan for things which other members of the royal family happened to be white did without any criticism. But if Meghan did them like eating avocado, for instance, you know, she got attacked for it. So there was a horrible media atmosphere out there for Meghan. And, you know, no one is saying that the entire royal family is racist. That would clearly not be fair. But like I say, speculating about how dark her child would be is, is utterly distasteful. Yeah, that, but that is the one incident. I mean, is it possible that women... Uh, are not embraced, outside, come from outside and are not embraced by the royal family. We don't have to go uh, very far back in history to see how uh, the press have, have, have treated other women coming into the royal family. Is it, a, is it a, a women thing rather than a race thing, potentially? No, I don't think it's just a woman thing because other women who married in the royal family, Kate, for instance, just did not get the relentless attacks that Meghan got. But it's true to say that it's tough marrying into the royal family. But it's also sad to say the royal family doesn't seem to have learned anything from what happened to Princess Di. You came into politics and you fought for your beliefs and you fought racism in politics. Could there be an argument that Meghan Markle would have been better staying inside the family and working herself for change within that family if this is the way that she felt about it rather than simply leaving and heading off back to the States? Well, she didn't simply leave. She was driven out by the tabloid media. And if you've seen the clips of the interview with Oprah Winfrey, she's a woman who endured great pain and great unhappiness. It's, it, they came close to breaking her. And I could understand that she thought that for the sake of her family and for the sake of herself as a mother of a young child, she had to leave and get some peace and some happiness. I mean, there are all these claims of the undertones of racism in the coverage, um, the press coverage of Meghan Markle. Um, Others say, other observers say, that there's been unfavourable press because of what they see as the self-pity and self-promotion of a couple uh, worrying about themselves when over 100,000 people in this country are dying from Covid. I think that's a ridiculous allegation. Meghan Markle got, um, she got criticised for being photographed with her hands in her pockets when the Queen had been photographed with her hands in her pockets. She got criticised for eating avocados when Kate Middleton had been eating avocados. There is a relentless pattern of Kate being attacked for things which other members of the royal family did without comment. Nobody can really look at the tabloid treatment of Meghan Markle and say it was fair. And you can't also not admit that there was an undertone of treating her as other, other than she wasn't somehow an English rose. And therefore, things that other women of the royal family could do, she couldn't do without criticism. Uh, how do you think the palace should deal with this? 
Well, I think it's like any um, difficulty in a family. I think the, the, the family just has to get through it. I mean, the last thing you want is a lot of tit for tat. Um, clearly, Meghan and Harry had a very, very difficult time. Now they want to be together as a young family without the kind of relentless attacks from the British media. And I think they should be allowed to do that. I mean, it is all very sad. It is a major rift now. But on International Women's Day, which it is, do you have <coughs> sympathy for a woman who has worked her entire life in the public service of this country and has had great loyalty to this country and to the work that she was uh, born to do? The Queen, do you have uh, sympathy for her being dragged through all this mess? Well... I have sympathy for the Queen, but if, if you saw the clips from the interview, both Meghan and Harry were at pains to say how much they respected the Queen and actually how fair she had been to them. This is not about the Queen. It is about, I think, some of the courtiers and advisors in the royal family. It's what they call the firm. But none of this is about the Queen. Harry and Meghan could not be more appreciative of the kindness that the Queen has shown them. And just on the point of uh, mental health that uh, Meghan uh, raises in the interview, do you think the, I mean, her claims should clearly be looked into, but do you think also the allegations that others have made about her should be fully investigated? Come on. These allegations came up two years later when they knew that the Oprah Winfrey interview was about to air. I think it but just feels like a little bit tit for tat. But it doesn't mean they have no validity. Yeah, but why weren't they investigated two years ago? Why have they waited until 48 hours before the Oprah Winfrey? But that's almost a separate question. That should be investigated too. But should the claims made of bullying against Meghan Markle be investigated? I deplore bullying, whoever it is from. But I think there's a degree of scepticism about these belated claims against Meghan Markle. I think okay. the royal family has to learn from this. OK. All right. Uh, Diane Abbott, we've run out of time. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks very much indeed. That was the MP, Diane Abbott, Member of Parliament for the Labour Party. She was the Shadow Home Secretary in Labour under Jeremy Corbyn. Um, she, under Sir Keir Starmer, is no longer in that position. She's been in the House of Commons in Parliament now in England for at least three decades and has been a great activist champion and continues to be. And I, I think is beloved. I, I, listen, I know she's also vilified and she's not liked by a lot of white Englanders who hate her guts who are racist towards her, who abuse her online with racism and misogynoir. And there are some white people who like her. But obviously her constituents in Hackney do. And some of them are white. I mean, so, you know, some white people like her because they vote for her. And they'll be voting for her again when she's up for re-election in May of this year, as the whole country of England and the UK at large is going through its elections for May of this year. The London mayor will be having an election, Sadiq Khan. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. I think Sadiq Khan will win, um, but, you know, you never know with these things. But Diane Abbott, I'll put her Twitter link up. Hackney Abbott, I think, is her Twitter handle. I'll put that up on the liner notes. Abbott with two Ts. Diane, common spelling, and Abbott with two Bs and two Ts. And she's just been excellent. Look, um, I know there's things people will criticize her on. Um, some of the statements that she may have made that some people uh, will criticize her on. And I can understand that. But I think she has, I shouldn't say but. I am saying that I, I, I would say she has been a champion for the working class for many a decade. And I would not be telling you the lie. I would be telling you the truth. And she is a very strong and needed voice in British politics. And we need to have more people following behind her. Because there are some, but not all, right? There's a great politician up in Newcastle, too. 
I think her name is Chi Anunua. I can't, see, this is problematic. When I try to pronounce names sometimes, I make a right pig's ear of it. So, um, she's won her, she won her seat in Newcastle. Uh, and she's been winning it. And she won re-election there, uh, I think in 20, 2019 or so, whenever it was. 20, whatever. But there are some, but we need more. We need more. And uh, we need more in more black people in the uh, House of Commons. We need more black people in behind the scenes and in front of the camera as well in the press. And uh, Diane Abbott there is talking to Mark Austin of Sky News, I should say, from Monday. That was yesterday. And talking about this interview and talking about Megan and all and the other things going on there. Um, that's going to be it here for me uh, for this episode. And... By the way, I want to tell you, there's some more uh, merchandise coming, and you're going to love this. The Love in Retro collection has been expanded. Do please check it out at the-politocrat.myshopify.com. Could you please? It would be much appreciated. But also make sure that you buy. That would be even more appreciated. And thank you to those of you who have already bought. I am so thankful and appreciative of you. Thank you for doing that. But tell your friends. And if you haven't bought something from the shop, please go ahead and do it now. Will you please? At the-politocrat.myshopify.com An an expansion of the Love in Retro t-shirt line. Colorful t-shirts evoking the 1960s love. You have to check these out. There's so much color. And color's good for you. Even these bright eye-popping colors, maybe not for those of you who um, have issues and suffer with epilepsy, that would not be good for you, um, for you in particular. There are shirts that aren't as bright colored and you can choose from those. And that the collection will continue to expand. As spring gets closer, you will find more of the Love in Retro collection, exclusively designed by yours truly exclusively at the-politocrat.myshopify.com. And I'm also going to be adding, um, this week you will see some additional other t-shirts coming into the store. Uh, I think you'll really like these ones as well. And there'll be more than just t-shirts. There'll be all kinds of other merchandise so that you can take a look at the store. Really, there's so much there. So please support the store. Please buy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.